Good afternoon. My name is Angela Zhang. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Law at the University of Hong Kong. Today, I'm very honored to um, have a distinguished guest, Professor Zhou Xueguang from Stanford University to come and talk to us about his latest research on Chinese bureaucracy. Before we start the presentation, let me uh, introduce Professor Zhou, although he's already a very, a very renowned scholar. His main research uh, interest is institutional changes in contemporary Chinese society, and with particular focus on Chinese organizations and management, social inequality, and state society relations. Before joining Stanford in 2006, Professor Zhou taught at Cornell, Duke, and Hong Kong UST. He is also a guest professor at Peking University, Tsinghua University, and the People's University of China. He received his doctoral degree um, in sociology from Stanford University in 1991. And I'm also very pleased to introduce a discussant uh, for Professor Zhou's talk, Professor Li Jing. Um, is a professor of management and strategy with joint uh, appointment in, in economics at University of Hong Kong. Before uh, coming to uh, Hong Kong, uh, Professor Li um, taught at Catlock School of Management and London School of Economics, where he was a tenured social professor of managerial economics and strategy. Professor Li's main research areas lies at the intersection of organizational economics, personnel economics, and labor economics. Um, it particularly focuses on the dynamics of informal relations and explores how firms can design organizations to align incentives and build trust. So I very much look forward um, to Professor Zhou's presentation and Professor Li's comments. And uh, we will also leave some time for Q&A. Without further ado, let me give the floor to Professor Zhou. Thank you, Angelo, for your invitation. And I will uh, also thank Professor Li Jin for serving as this content. I look, look forward to hearing your comments. And thank you all for being here. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, let's see. Does it work? Uh, okay, uh, can you see the screen? Okay, so uh, my research has been focused on the Chinese bureaucracy. And since this forum is Hong Kong U's law school, so I thought it would be, make sense to connect my research with this historical phenomenon about the Confucianization of law in this larger context. So therefore, this is the, my title the, of my talk, The Confucianization of Law Revisited Informal Institutions in the Chinese Bureaucracy. So let me now first give you an outline of my talk today. Oops. So I want to start with this historical phenomenon, the Confucianization of law proposed by historian and sociologist Xu Tongzhu some many years ago. And I want to connect to the current contemporary relevance of this phenomenon in the Chinese bureaucracy, what I called the Confucianization of Chinese bureaucracy. And I want to spend some time to interpret this puzzle and its persistence in today's China. And I will end my discussion with some discussion about implications for state building in China. So I will start with his legal institutions in this context. I want to focus on the current bureaucratic practice in China. And I want to focus on ending with a discussion about state, state making in a contemporary China. And so it started with historical context and move on to contemporary practice and will end with implications for the future, for the future of China, uh, China's bureaucracy. So let me start with the historical phenomenon, the Confucianization of law. As we all know, in a larger context, since the Middle Ages, the Western civilization has evolved through what Max Weber called the rationalization processes in which the legal rational authority gradually move to the center of everyday life. When we say legal rational uh, authority, 
I meant the application of a set of abstract rules to everyday life jurisdictions. And also one key principle is the equality of everybody before the law. And this of course is rooted as many scholars research has uh, uh, demonstrated it has been deeply rooted in the uh, Roman law and the reli uh, religious origins of Christianity. Okay, so the Western civilization evolved in, in its own path of change. But if we move our attention to the East and the Confucian culture becomes a very important, unique reference point where the hierarchical order of uh, Li, the Chinese Li, becomes the important reference point. Well, when we talk about Chinese Li, it's really a system of differentiated social roles upon which individuals are expected to behave in certain ways. And this is what uh, sociologist Fischer Tong called the differential mode of association, which I will turn to you uh, later. So in this context, in the Confucian culture, Xu Tongzhu, the sociologist, also historian, observed in, in, in this really a great book called The Law in Society. Uh, and here's uh, the cover, cover of this book, Law and the Society in Traditional China, where he demonstrated or discussed this phenomenon, what he called the Confucianization of, of law, by which he means that the Confucian scholars introduced into the code, the principles and the spirit of Li, together with his concrete rules of behavior and enforce them by legal system, by legal sanction. And in Chinese, this is what he called Yi Li Ru Fa. Now, what do we mean by Yi Li Ru Fa or by uh, Fa Lui Ru Jia Hua, the Confucianization of law? So let me give you one example. Uh, and this is a quote from Hai Ri. As we all know, Hai Ri by reputation is the most principled official uh, in, Ming, in Ming Dynasty. And this is what he wrote down uh, in, in his discussion about how to make ju uh, uh, judge uh, in, in uh, civil uh, lawsuits. And when he said that when there's a doubt in making judgment in civil, civil suits, he would suggest that you should rule against the younger brother rather than the elder brother. And you should rule against the nephew rather than the uncle, or against the rich rather than the poor. And also, if the case involves property dispute, it is better to rule against members of the gentry rather than the commoners so as to provide relief to the weaker side. But if the case has to do with courtesy or status, then it is better to rule against the commoner rather than against the gentry for the purpose is to maintain our order and the system." End quote. So this is what Harry, the main official, interprets so-called Confucianization of law. Because um, what is the basis for making judgment? In addition to facts, everything else, you also have to think about the kind of hierarchical structures imposed by the Confucian culture. Now, it is not a far stretch, far stretch then to extend this line of argument into the Chinese bureaucracy because bureaucrats in traditional China serve not only as the head of the public administration, but also as the judge in the court uh, making judgment on civil lawsuits, right? So what we will call the Confucianization of the Chinese bureaucracy really is the infusion of social relations and cultural expectations into bureaucratic practice. So the Confucian culture provides the basic basis for people to deal with each other, to arrange their social relations and their bureaucratic practice in, uh, in, in the Chinese context. And that produces the kind of stable patterns of behaviors, what we will call the institutionalized behaviors in a Chinese bureaucracy. So for example, we all know that a civil service examination, the Kuji Zidu, has been proclaimed as one of the most important or central institutions in the Chinese bureaucracy. And one of these 
important feature is so-called merit-based evaluation system, right? It is a breakaway from privileges. But we also learned from tons of research in this area that the civil service examination also produced social circles based on now we call it 同年, 同门, or 同乡, right? So historian Philip Cohen wrote uh, the following passage. And he said that factions in the 18th, uh, 18th century bureaucracy were generally based not on shared opinions about policy, but on ties of kinship, regional origin, and academic patronage. The civil service examination system was a veritable fact faction factory. So this is the way the, even the civil service examination, which is, which is seen as the merit-based evaluation proce process, also produce this kind of social, informal social institutions. And I would argue, I want to uh, take this a little bit a, a step further to argue that this social behaviors, the informal social relations is embedded in a much larger social context. And this is what I, I would call it, uh, using, borrowing uh, facial tones uh, expression, the differential mode of association, cha xu ge ju. So here's a quote from Fei Xiaotong, who wrote this uh, in the 1940s. He said that social relations in China are like circles that appear on the surface of a lake when a rock is thrown into it. Everyone stands at the center of the circles produced by his or her own social inference. So it varies by individuals. Each web has itself at the center and every web has its own different center. And here's a quote in original Chinese for some of you who are interested in reading uh, uh, these passages. So the image, the image from this uh, argument here or the metaphor that Fei Xiaotun used is that each individual actually is occupying that its own center, his or her own center, and the social relations is arranged based on the social distance, either in reference to blood relations, kinships, or some, of, some other kinship analogy, right? So for example, in terms of blood relationships, the family is the most closely uh, related to self. So they are in the inner circle. Then extending forwards, you have the 10 members of the kinship. Then further away, you have friends. Then at the outer uh, circle, you have strangers. So the idea behind this, this metaphor of cha xu ge ju is that they are not only based on so-called blood or kinship relationships, but they can be generalized into a patriarchal institutions into other areas. And that's what, exactly what we are talking about when we think in terms of the Confucianization of law or the Confucianization of bureaucracy. That is the infusion of social relations, differential treatment of different social groups in legal practice or in, in bureaucratic practice. Now, in recent years, there has been some debate, actually expansion of this idea. So when Fei Xiaotong talks about cha xu ge ju, he talks about mostly about individual-centered, ego-centered social relations, whereas people, scholars now argue that there's also vertical lines that is, the, these, these social circles are actually arranged in a vertical, vertical sense. That is to say, even in a, in a kinship relationship, there's a hierarchy involved. And this lead me to propose that there's a duality of hierarchy and patriarchy in the Chinese bureaucracy. And there are two dimensions on this. One is vertical hierarchies organized vertically and the other one is horizontal organization of differential treatments based on social distance. So these are two dimensions organized into what we call the Confucianization of bureaucracy in a Chinese context. And what is more important is that even though we are talking about individuals organized based on blood or kinship relationships, this is really a mirror image of the, how the nation states in China has been organized. In the Chinese context, we talk about 家国同构, 
That is to say, these two systems, the family, family systems or social relations form on a family uh, basis versus power relations formed at nation state uh, uh, levels, they are actually mirror images and they mutually reinforce each other. And that's why they produce this kind of robust and persistent structures. So if you look at the larger picture in, in the uh, Chinese context, what on the vertical side, we have this hierarchy of the absolute state. When I use the absolute state, I borrow from the European literature. When we talk about the rise of the kings and, and uh, uh, royalties in that context. So the emperors of the king holds the arbitrary power and they use hierarchical organizations to act to ins, uh, ex, exert control of officials. Okay. On the horizontal side, we have the patriarchal authority, which is based on family and kinship organizations. And there's a differential, differential treatments based on kinship ties, or they are more generalized, what we call quasi kinship rela authority relations in a different aspect of the society. So these are the kind of issues we have discussed about traditional society. So the next question is, what about contemporary society? Are these whatever cultural elements we talk about, the Confucian models of bureaucracy, of law, do they persist over time into our uh, life today? And this is what I'm going to uh, uh, discuss next. And indeed, my argument is that they are persisting into our life today. But we need to answer this, we need to address this question. I would first make a point that the his, there's a historical divide between 1949, before and after. That is to say, after 40, 1949, when the People's Republic of China uh, uh, was founded, there is really a new organization, organizational form, new institution that was this categorically different from the past. The Leninist Party organization, the Marxist Leninist ideology, really is two pillars of the Chinese revolution that in many ways people would argue had a put a fundamental break with the past. They inserted very tightened bureaucratic organization that is historically unprecedented and in, impose and insists on discipline and political loyalty of, at a scale and a speed no other uh, uh, previous empires can rival. So this raises, raises a larger question. What about Confucianism? What about the cultural legacy of Confucian uh, Confucian doctrines. Is it a break uh, from the past or there's some kind of past dependency of some sort? And these are the kind of issues I want to, instead of making, giving you all these arguments or uh, gather evidence on my own, I want to take, you uh, uh, take a tour through the research literature about Mao's China and post Mao China. And we can see there's really different views about this set of issues. So let me start with these two really two quotes from two eminent scholars, one political scientist, one uh, uh, historian. And they both argued that there's a fundamental break with the past. So for example, Sherman, a political scientist writing at the height of the cultural revolution, he's commenting about the legacies of the Chinese revolution. And he argued in that book, so there are two fundamental pillars of the Chinese revolution. One is organization, the other one is the uh, ideology. And these two pillars have tr fundamentally transformed the Chinese uh, society. And that's, and, and I quote here, by transforming, the Chin uh, transforming Chinese society, it has brought a great power into being, which proclaimed itself the revolution, revolutionary and developmental models for the poor countries of the world, okay? And that in that book, he provided much details of, of discussion about this, what he called fundamental break with the traditional society. And Joseph Levinson, uh, uh, the historian who wrote this really uh, masterpiece on uh, the Confucian China and its modern fate. And 
in which he also make this uh, commentary. He said, basically, let me just paraphrase his argument here. He said, of course, the communist, communists in China still preserves Confucianism, but they preserve it as uh, what he called museum keepers restores. That is, it treated as like object in a museum, put it inside the museum as a legacy for people to, res to, to respect, to look at it, but has nothing to do, has no relevance to contemporary China, to the China that, that the, the Chinese Revolution tried to build, the new China. So this is the argument that is published by eminent scholars uh, in the Mao era. But let's remember during that period of time, China, the door to China is closed. No one knows really what's going on in China and people are speculating, you know, of gathering other you know, secondary uh, evidence. But in a, in a post mall era, in the 1980s, when China opened its door to the outside world and researchers rushed into China to have a glimpse of what is going on or what was going on at that time, that is in the Mao era and the beginning of the post mall era. And this, this is the fraud of research in the 1980s, really to capture what, what I would call the prevalent importance, the centrality of informal social relations in that research leadership. There's a huge change, a sea change about you know, what we know about China before uh, the, the, door to, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the door to China is opened, uh, closed and, and opened. So let me just give you a rundown the list of scholars who really contributed to this leadership. Uh, Harry Harting, Susan Shirk, Tom Gold, Andy Water, Hannes Lipothal, and Mayfair Young. And Mayfair Young's book published in you know, uh, uh, the mid 1990s, but her field work was, was, was carried out in the 1980s. So all these scholars, right after the post-war era, look at into China and realize that the so-called revolutionary legacy of, of the, uh, the Mao's China is, not, is simply not there. What we observe is the prevalent central, central roles of informal social relations in Chinese society and in the Chinese bureaucracy. And that literature has extended into 1990s into sociology and organization research. And I just gave you two uh, prominent uh, scholars who published widely on that topic, Nan Lin and Yan Jiebian. And they both demonstrated you know, the importance of so, important role of social relations in everyday life from a sociological point of view. Now, in the last three or four decades, there's also large number of studies focusing on the Chinese bureaucracy and bureaucratic practice. And again, here we discovered or rediscovered the really central role of uh, so informal institutions in the practice in the Chinese bureaucracy. I'm just giving you some, some of the names about I mean, the, the terms people use to describe so called bian tong, flexible, and selective implementation, and collusions among local governments, gong mao, that is often in the form of strategic use of information or the formalism in terms of uh, uh, symbolic compliance and the social relations have been used in a, in a wide different ways in policy implementations as a way of mobilizing resources, as a way of getting things done using social relations or actually imposing penalty and deterrence by family association. We have many, many studies on these fronts. And this is an interesting study, uh, a dissertation, a PhD dissertation uh, by a sociologist, uh, Feng Junqi. And in the title of the dissertation is called Zhongxian Gan Bu, where he focused on just looking at one county and for more, all the key offices in that county. What he found is that for all the key offices in that county, it had been occupied or controlled by about a dozen families. And this picture here is just one family's ties, the one, this one couple here and their extended families, in-laws and, and the children 
occupied more than a dozen of different offices in that, in that county. So as I just said, the whole different offices in that county have been occupied by about a dozen uh, families or kinships. Okay. So as you can see, informal social relations or the confucianization of bureaucracy is striving even in the post war era. So that really raises a larger question. Why in, in the society of Leninist organizations and Marxist ideology, we still observe this persistence of the cultural legacies that Chu uh, Tongzhu uh, observed you know, in 1930s and 40s. And as we know, there are different ways of organizing, of course. Economists in recent years have talked a great deal about organizations as a nexus of contracts. Right? You can think about organizations is organized by different kinds of contracts, about uh, employment relationships, inter-firm transactions, or compliance to institutional legal regulations and environment, such as the corporate social responsibility issues. Right? And these are the legal rational basis I mentioned before. And of course, the Marxist, uh, I mean, the uh, Leninist party organization imposes different logic the logic about organizational control and ideology, about political control, discipline, loyalty, we talked about. And this is what I will call a political logic that, that is involved. And I just discussed a third logic, that is the bureaucracy as a nexus of social relations. So we do have, in this hierarchy, we do have rules, but rules are also modified or uh, softened by social relations. We talk about rule enforcement, but we also give room for flexibility. And this is the kind of social or cultural logic that is at work. And here I want, also want to highlight two different kinds of networks that is as a basis of this kind of behaviors. In many studies, especially as uh, uh, ethnographic research and sociological research of the past, people have emphasized so-called the golden rule of reciprocity as the basis of social relations. So in a way, if you think about this reciprocity as a basis of social relations, it really is a market-like solutions, right? Relationships will, be, will change or vary depending on the calculation of cost and the benefit. That if it's reciprocal, it will last or uh, perpetuate, but if it's asymmetric, then quickly this kind of relationship would dissolve or lead to some other you know, new balance, right? So people talk about in this larger context, people talk about different type of uh, social relations or ties, some strong ties or weak ties or emotional ties or uh, instrumental ties and so on and so forth. But I want to argue that in social relation in a Chinese bureaucracy is not like that kind of reciprocity based a uh, uh, network, rather is what I call identity-based network. So if you think about the officials and their relationship that they cultivated in their uh, work environment, first of all, there's always workplace-based, right, downway oriented, and their mobility is confined with a closed internal labor market, and there's intensive interactions around authority structures, and social relations, a typical is not only hierarchical, but also multiplex. That is, it involves multiple dimensions. Their co-work experience, they come from a, a school alum relationships, and some of these are uh, entered marriage relationships. So because of these features, this kind of network tend to be stable, robust, and long-term. So this is actually a great threat to a centralized state, right? If you think about it, on the one hand, you have the hierarchy already uh, Leninist uh, party organization. And on the other hand, you have the Confucian bureaucracy that's infused with social relations. On the one hand, you have centralization of authority, vertical structure here. But on the other hand, you have the multiple egocentric social circles that uh, 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 Goji we talked about. And on the one hand, you emphasize political loyalty to the party line. On the other hand, you have the patient-client relationships that persist 
at a horizontal level. So it's, not, it's no wonder that we observe strong reactions and quite frequent from the top-down process. That is the effort in the last 70 years of tightening up bureaucratic constraints in terms of inspection, evaluation, incentives, and of course, formal rules. And also we observe waves of political campaigns that try to combat or constrain, contain the widespread informal social relations in the bureaucracy. But I want to point out that ironically, there are also countervailing forces in de-bureaucratization, in informalization, and the reproduction of the informal and social relations. And here I want you just just say a few words about in real, in actual bureaucratic practice. Uh, what are the sources that produce this kind of uh, uh, informal social uh, processes? Now, if we, for those of us who study uh, bureaucrats or you interact with local officials and you understand they, they face tremendous pressures to get things done, to fulfill the requirement. But they do this under huge uncertainty and arbitrary power from the top. So you have to get things done, but using all kinds of means, including through flexible implementation, you get things done through collusive behavior, or you get things done through symbolic compliance. But all these, all these require social relations, not the formal bureaucratic rules, rule following, but social relations in or around bureaucracy. For example, mobilization for resources. Not most of the time, the resources you can mobilize is you can activate using social relations rather than using bureaucratic rules. You want to cover up to ensure symbolic compliance. Again, that requires dense social relations. And local problem solving often involves bending the bars on the so-called iron cage of the bureaucracy, and which also requires the, the lubricant of the uh, uh, in social relations. So this re really lead me to the issue about the last topic I want to touch on, what are the implications for state building in China, given the kind of issues we have discussed. So let's return to the larger picture I begin with. That is, we talk about the Confucianization of law in the historical context, and we talk about bureaucratic practice in the current today, today's China. And then we are moving on to think the larger issue about the distinctive state building path that China has taken uh, in the last, say, uh, since 1949. So what have we learned about this? Now, let me just take a step back and think about the rise of modern states from a European experience, because we, at least in the literature, the modern state takes a form really in Europe. And, and that's why there are so many studies focusing on the European experience. In that picture, in that part of the world, we, what we observed is a graduation of centralization from bottom up. You know, the aristocracies, the local laws, all over the place, they gradually aggregated centralized upwards into the kingdom, into the uh, royalty. So in that process of state building, what we have here is the increasing formalization of institutions in taxation, in finance, in military, in public administration, and so on and so forth. And in this long process, the role of formal organization and the hierarchy extremely important. And the counterpart in uh, the informal social relations declined over time. But China took a very distinctive path of state building in its own history. So historically, if you look at the Chinese state building process, the centralization and formalization sets in very early on and over a very large uh, territory. So by Han Dynasty, uh, Chinese, Chinese state already had a elaborate bureaucratic organizations. So the bureaucracy, bureaucracy is elaborate, but not necessarily very effective. And that of course met a lot of challenges in its governability over a large territory. 
And so it resorted to the ideology and the practice of Confucianism for cultural integration. And there are many discussions in the literature on this point. And so the essence of the, cult, uh, the Confucianism, is, at least from the government's point of view, is the differentiation, differentiated social roles around the patriarchal order and the kinship organizations played a very large role as a key mechanism in local governance. And of course, there's also institutionalization of the Confucian doctrines in legal practice that produce the Confucianization of the law and in bureaucratic practice. And this also gave rise to what I just discussed about the central role of identity-based networks in and around uh, Chinese bureaucracy. In contemporary China, if we fast forward to today's uh, 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 China, what we observe is that the Latinist party organization acquires tremendous organizational capacities to get things done. And we have our witnessed great achievement in, of the past uh, 70 years, but there's also tendency to over-centralize in resources and in decision-making and overreach into society in terms of neighborhood organizations or villages and so on and so forth. And that produces or in triggers the kind of principal agent problems that economists talk a great deal about and organizational failures that induce corresponding responses. And these responses that I, wa I want to just briefly mention here, they produce the kind of mechanisms for social, informal social uh, uh, institutions. There are two processes. First, the bottom up, that is local officials. When you try to manage local governance, they have to make use of the cultural repertoire for governance. And I've already mentioned all these issues in terms of mobilization based on social relations, problem solving based on social relations, and political control and penalty based on family association. All these actually reinforce social institutions in practice. So this, this is the bottom up uh, process, but interestingly and ironically, there's also top down processes that try to produce this, strengthen this kind of social relations. So for example, we have heard many instances of the recent practice about bureaucratic uh, uh, practice, all these are the antithesis of bureaucratic bureaucratization or formalization of the organizations, right? And also think about the common ex expression about politics in command. What does that mean? It means that you, you threw your rules, your formal regulations out of the window. You try to get things done, whether legal or illegal, whether it's, uh, it's bureaucratic or social. In other words, other, in other words that allows you or encourage local officials to mobilize in whatever way possible to get things done. And that includes, of course, informal social relations. So my argument or conclusion here is that the informal institutions are renewed and reinforced in these processes from both bottom-up process practice and top-down uh, uh, pro processes. So let me actually just end my talk with the final thoughts uh, here. Uh, informal institutions and practice infuse vitality and flexibility into China's governance. It provides a, a corrective mechanism for the centralization of, of authority in China, and at the same time, allowing variability and adaptation at the local levels. Okay. So, Making sense of this, these informal institutions and practice help us understand the dis distinctive path of state building in China and the pervasive informal practice in the Chinese context, which is very likely to continue into the future. But I want to leave this question to, to you that if these distinctive features, if in a closed system, you now we all understand, we all. Uh, 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 we are familiar with, and we know 
their strategy to deal with these issues. But once it, the war, when the doors open up, when the meet with other re, rule regimes, there are different with different logics, then there could be really uh, serious issues to consider in terms of interactions between different rule regimes and different practice across different national borders. So let me stop here and thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhou. Um, let me stop my sharing. Now, now so I would like to invite Professor Li to give his feedback and comments. Great. Um, let me also share screen first. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, uh, we, are, we are seeing your... Uh, you are seeing the next slide also, maybe. Yes. Nope. Maybe I will just act. Can I just do this? Is it, yes. Maybe it's a little bit too small. Yes, this is better. A bit bigger. All yes. right. Let's, uh, let's do that. Um, so it's a great pleasure to discuss uh, Xue Guang's work on full disclosure at some level. I like to think about uh, Xue Guang as my academic uh, uncle also, because uh, Xue Guang's advisor uh, at Stanford, James March, is the advisor of my uh, PhD advisor, Bob Gibbons uh, at MIT. Um, my talk at some level complements uh, Xue Guang's talk in the sense that uh, I'm going to emphasize a bit more on the dynamic aspect of institution. So well, let me make this smaller here. Let me set to the stage by first now talking about what I mean by uh, what are the formal and informal institution. Broadly speaking, you can think about formal institution that these are like how things sh should be done in paper. These are the contracts, rules, laws. And informal institutions are how things are done in practice. These are the norms and the routines, okay? So, you know, there's lots, large literature on kind of uh, how informal institution complement or substitute formal institutions. Here, yeah, I want to emphasize something slightly different, which is both type of institution actually change over time. Okay, if we look at how they change in particular, on, in a sense that I would say there are two alternatives in thinking about how formal institution changes. Now, to be more concrete, let's say there's a new law that comes in and society can think about, you know, how to adapt to it. One version of the adaptation, I would call it formal adaptation. And the feature of that, it is very public. You now, new law comes in, maybe people kind of are going to disagree with it a little bit or want to modify this somewhat. So before the law actually come into place, people are actually going to give voices, okay? Give suggestions or even protests. That's the ex-ante stage. But once the law is passed, then people are likely to comply to it. And if you really hate it, you may exit, okay? So at some level, you can think about this is a fairly the European way of thinking about it. And you know, many of you probably recognize this is the Albert Hirschman's way of exit voice, exit and loyalty, right? That, that is the typical way of thinking about organizational change. This is what I'm gonna call formal adaptation. What I think on uh, Xue Guang's uh, have emphasized and highlighted is really cool is something called informal adaptation. If you think about what's informal adaptation, is a kind of a law comes in, I'm just gonna accept it. I'm not gonna talk about it. And sometimes you actually just give me the law immediately. But what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna informally adapt to it. Okay, so this is the way that I'm gonna do flexible uh, implementation. Maybe there's collusion in some ways. It's fairly easy to see kind of the advantage of a formal adaptation, but let me also emphasize that there are benefits of informal adaptation as well. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not going into details, but at least on, um, you can think about, you know, at least uh, one advantage is it, it avoids the haggling costs or it makes on um, some of the law more easily to be adapted, which can be a fish, uh, beneficial feature. Okay, now going back to Xue Guang's talk on kind of the confusionization of law. Okay, well, here I would say there are two questions. 
The first question is, you know, does Confucian um, culture, and one version of it, I'm always not going to do full justice to it, is the hierarchical order. Does it actually favor this type of informal adaptations and lead to the use of more informal institutions? The second question is, you know, if so, how does Confucian culture affect the evolution of both formal and informal institutions? Okay. Going back to the first question, you know, I think in the end it's an empirical question. And these days you probably look at, you know, a particular province, what's your distance to a Confucian type of a school, like Yue Lu Shu Yuan, and then see, you know, how many informal institutions are there. Uh, but you know, from a theoretical perspective, you know, you see both demand and supply reason for why Confucian culture will lead into informal institutions, right? So the uh, demand is like, you know, we want to show respect. We want to listen to elders. That's the Li aspect. So that, you know, we are more likely not to say no, not to publicly voice our disapproval. And then from the supply side is that because of the, all the social uh, relationship, you know, all my uh, relatives, uh, officials, it makes me easier to do collusion, to do implement, informal implementation. Uh, but to me, I mean, a lot of time what I think it's a yes or no to this uh, question has to do with you know, my own experience and the background. And so here I want to volunteer a story I heard on a newspaper article when I was a kid is again, uh, China in the 80s. So that's a story about, you know, uh, Chinese, uh, probably Chinese went to uh, Japan. And then he was working in a restaurant and he needed to wash dishes, okay? And the, the manager says, okay, you need to make the dish really clean. You need to wash it six times. That's the rule, okay? And then the Chinese worker, and after a while, actually he told his Japanese co-worker, he said, you actually don't need to wash it six times. You only need to wash it five times and it's equally clean and the manager is not going to find out. And the Japanese co-worker was shocked. Now, how can you actually you know, do it only five times, rules of rules? And uh, the Chinese uh, workers think, actually, I'm only doing it four times instead of five times. Okay, so if you think about uh, a story like this, you know, one version of it is maybe kind of it's in our DNA somewhere that we are more likely to think about how to do the informal responses, the informal adaptations to the rules. We're not going to argue against the rules. We're going to find our own ways to deal with it. So if the answer to the first question again is yes, let's think about you know, how Confucian culture affects the evolution of both formal and informal institution. And the implicit framework here, and this is essentially Xue Guang's framework, is that Confucianism can be think about as a long lasting, uh, persistent institution. It's almost a matter institution out there. It's some way that implicitly that affects our preferences. That's going to affect both the formal and informal institution evolve. And a specific channel here is that once we see formal changes in our uh, institution, we're gonna do more informal adaptation. So what are the consequences of this? This is coming to, again, Confucianism and bureaucracy. This is, I'm gonna add a bit more dynamics. The first is that once we have rule, we're gonna have more informal adaptation. Going back to the example now, the rule is that uh, I am going to, the rule says that I need to wash the dish six times. Okay, and an informal adaptation is I'm actually just a cut corner, do it five times. But you know, once if I do it five times, I'm not caught. I do a little bit of reinforcement learning. That's the fancy word these days. Okay, I'm going to cut corner a bit more, four times, three times, until one day what's going to happen, it's likely to be I'm either going to get caught or maybe kind of the customers get sick or whatever reason. And then we, the central authority is going to know that, okay, you are actually doing informal adaptation. If you do informal adaptation, how's the center going to respond? They're going to respond by giving more monitoring, perhaps they add more rules, and maybe they add a different types of rules. I would add, maybe they'll add rules that are more crude. And these rules are more crude either because these are rules, you know, in response to emergency, so they don't have time to think about, or maybe these rules are strategically crude because easy, these cruder rules are easier to monitor. Okay, they're gonna spend a lot of resources to monitor. And then what's the further consequence? One of the consequences is that the state is, or the organization is gonna spend a lot of time to monitor, but you cannot monitor forever. So you run into some kind of a cycles. That's emphasized in some of, I think it's great work uh, by Xue Guang. 
But another consequences of this, you know, as I already alluded earlier, is that we want to see more monitoring, more rules. As a result, we're going to see more bureaucrats. Bureaucrats does in, use informal rules, but the bureaucrats nevertheless. So I cannot resist, uh, but you know, showing you this quote from one of my favorite uh, uh, shows uh, called the Yes Minister. So this is uh, about uh, you know, this is a person on. This is actually from a book, which is the fictitious diary of this uh, Minister of Internal and Administrative Affairs. You know, he says, you know, furthermore, every thing uh, one does is carefully watched and supervised by the secretary. And, and then there's an editorial comment that it's no accident that most of the really powerful offices in the world are called secretary, secretary of state, permanent secretary general, secretary party, secretary, secretary. Secretary means the person who is entrusted with the secrets, the information no one else knows, the elites. But one thing you notice is that this slide is actually giving you a British example instead of a Chinese example. I actually, at some level, I feel this type of informal adaptation occurs not just in China. It happens actually in, in UK. And there's some recent empirical work. If you look at the Navy officers, how they're allocated, there's a story about patronage plays an important role. Even in this uh, particular show, you look at these permanent undersecretary, they are also based on identity. They are all Oxford graduates. It's only the poor minister who is an LSC graduate, right? So maybe in the long run, we all get to this type of uh, the yes minister syndrome that bring down all organizations, maybe culture differs somewhat, but I think there's a uniform, uh, universal force to it. And if you ask me, you know, what's the cure for this force? I think actually there's no cure to this uh, to this type of uh, disease internally. The only cure is actually to be opening up, allow for competition, have external incentive competition that can actually deal with it. So I'm going to end my, my discussion here. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, for um, really um, thought-provoking comments. I wonder if Professor Joe would like to say a few words first uh, before opening it up for Q&A, or uh, would you like to go directly to Q&A? Uh, just uh, a few words. First of all, I, this is why I really like to this, have discussions with the economists. They are very clear, they are, they are very logical, and they pinpoint the, the kind of issues, make them very analytical. So that's it's great. So thank you, uh, Li Jin, uh, all, all these great comments. And I, I will also acknowledge that when I would think about these issues, uh, I have tried very hard to put into a pers comparative perspective. And I, I'm writing a paper pretty much trying to compare so-called the, the uh, Roman law-based contractual views of social relations versus uh, the Confucian views of, you know, based on social differentiations. There's some literature and discussion on, the, uh, on this point, but I want to, you know, uh, first, uh, you have really pinpoint the key issues that I need to address I have not yet and I want to really uh, have, hopefully we can have a future discussions on, on these issues. Yeah, I'll stop here. Well, thank you, Professor Zhou. Yes, I, I, I also very much like uh, Professor Lee's um, uh, feedback. And I also wonder exactly the same question that he posed uh, for you is, is, you know, Confucianism, I mean, this kind of influence, is it unique to China, I guess, in other, jurisdictions, um, social relationship could also be close knit. And, and as you've written in your past work that you have quoted, like works like Robert Alexand um, on uh, those <laughs> uh, California cow uh, rental farmers, and then they also have resolved dispute. And there is a quite abundant literature in law economics um, showing how social relationship can be used uh, as a substitute uh, for formal re legal relationships. However, I do very much enjoy the framework that you describe. And actually, I think they have great relevance uh, for what's happening today. I mean, I can give you a most recent example in relation to the Evergrande property crisis. Um, partly the crisis um, has to do with the government's tighter control over uh, the you know, first is the purge uh, of corruption in the coal sector, particularly started from in the Mongolia, 
And second is the passage and adoption of a criminal law, uh, which um, further strengthened the protection for coal miners and could potentially um, you know, put those uh, uh, coal owners in jail if they fail to provide proper protection. And these two things adding together, these two formal institutions, uh, create strong deterrent for uh, coal producers to overproduce coal. Now, given this, um, um, uh, 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 sorry, I, I was talking about the, the energy crisis. So, and 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 this, these two incidents, and now given this current energy crisis, um, now the, the government's rolling back and and push the, the these uh, coal producers um, to uh, to produce above um, you know the usual safety uh, level right I mean so you definitely see uh, even the top down can be flexible uh, for right I mean now it's become a we need to ensure uh, the sufficient production uh, of, uh, of enough um, uh, uh, coal uh, so to, to help Chinese people to get through the winter. And, and, and then no, in relation to the Evergrande crisis, I can also think about another example where these, um, the, the formal institution that was imposed there was the three red lines um, imposing strict uh, you know, requirements of the property de developers uh, not to over the leverage. But then that leads to a lot of the adverse consequences with all these property de developers going to bankrupt with Evergrande with all this problem. And now, the government it, and the firm are now in a dynamic situation where the firm is trying strategically trying to entice uh, um, the, the government to bail them out, right? I mean, trying to roll back those formal requirements. So the the framework that you produce is incredibly helpful at explaining the, the governance problems that we are observing in China almost every day. <laughs> And I can think of numerous examples, and I and that's why I really like your work so much. And um, and now I would like to open the floor uh, for uh, questions. And please type your questions uh, in the chat box. Um, I have received one question from uh, Liu Bing, dear Professor Zhou. As we have been hearing frequently, that China wants to upgrade its jurisdictional system by relying more on regulations rather than social relations, does that mean China will gradually lose the infusion of social relations? Yeah, this is a good question and uh, a great hope. Uh, over the years, I have more or less uh, uh, losing hope on this uh, promise because uh, rule, rule of law has been uh, pursued uh, for many, many years. And we see some progress in some areas, but then of course, just like Angela, the example Angela just gave, that under whatever are the pressures and these things will give in very quickly. So my, this is another issue about comparative institutional analysis, that is, if you think about the way that the trajectory of state building in the Chinese history and until today, within the current framework, is, is there cumulative improvement? You know, what I mean by institutional build up in terms of constraining informal relations and allows, you know, more gradually, but surely the progress in terms of you know, rule of law, I would say, I don't see the evidence so far. The point is that we could make progress in certain in certain ways and over time, but then there's a rollback, and quickly, you know, the, whatever had been accumulated just collapsed overnight and move up. We have to restart somewhere again. So, so I do not feel very promising that the kind of trend about improving uh, rule of law over social relations, at least in the current framework. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too, because what we observe is the Chinese government have unleashed an unprecedented amount of regulation in the tech sector, but at the same time, we also see a lot of informal institutions being applied, allowing right. bureaucrats with a lot of flexibility in controlling exactly. 
uh, the tech firms. And even with the introduction of property tax, you now formally they want to um, you know, push for the, this reform, but informally they leave the discretion to the local government and uh, which largely can decide, you know, first, whether they want to do it. And second, you know, what is the rate and how they want to push forward the reform. So, so I, I see, you know, this kind of flexibility and, and the top down both combined in, in the Chinese context. Yeah. yeah. If I can uh, just uh, add a little bit more to, the, to, to what just Angela said, I wrote uh, elsewhere informal practice really is 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 important in this in this uh, dispensable uh, component in governing China that is to say you cannot live only with formal rules you have to allow informal practice to take over at certain times in certain areas to make a balance between the formal rules and informal practice to to solve or, or at least to alleviate the kind of tensions between what I call the centralization of authority versus effective local governance. And, and we don't have other alternatives. And this is what I think uh, uh, Professor Li Jin uh, uh, started early. You could have you know, formal rules that allows you know, implementation in a way that is you know, predictable uh, and also uh, reasonable. But then without that, you have to allow some kind of informal adaptation, <laughs> which you know, give the appearance of you know formalism, you know, a, a compliance, symbolic compliance, but allows local adaptation. But the, in Chinese context, these solutions are informal rules, informal practice. It's not about legal rules, not about you know giving because you have to allow some kind of autonomy to make legal rules, you know, a really effective. But without a local autonomy, uh, you have to allow at least you know, the hidden informal practice to solve these local adaptation issues. Right, and I mean, Professor Joe, but when you have leave that autonomy and when you allow these informal institutions to exist, it could also come with a cost in that it becomes less transparent. And that's one of the, you know, often heard complaints about the Chinese government's model and Chinese government policy is the policy is very <laughs> transparent. And then, so that leads to unpredictability, right? Yes. I mean, so your efficiency and unpredictability coexist at the same time. Yes, agreed. Let me just add one thing. I thought, you know, this is a point I would like to emphasize of uh, um, Guang's, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really important uh, theoretical construct, which is the family state isomorphism. I think this is the, because of the Confucianism out there, there is the Jia Guo Tong Go. So it's very important that we respect the rule from above. This to me is kind of an you know, economist way of thinking about it. That's the exogenous constraint. <laughs> Once you have that exogenous constraint, then you know rules from above cannot be disobeyed in some way, which means it will force an informal adaptation, which yes. then will strengthen the uh, informal institution out there. I think that's that's the loop. That, that's um, that's just a point. Yeah. If I just uh, add, Li uh, Jin, actually, Fei Xiaotong made almost the exact uh, point you just described. <laughs> yes, he said, with the elderly, you cannot disobey them, but then you can just in practice, just ignore <laughs> their instructions. Yeah, that's what I do with my mother-in-law all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Is this going to be broadcasted? <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, Professor Joe, if you have time to answer one more question from our students, um, from uh, Jin, uh, Sun Jing. To, oh, actually, he has two questions. How do you look at the impact of transnational legal orders on China's legal orders? I think that seems to touch on what you said at the end. Like the US-China first round deal, um, it's reopening its in the domestic financial market? And second, how do you consider the future impact of Chinese legal orders on the rest of the world, like the BRI and, and other uh, programs? Well, these are very uh, uh, professional questions. I am not a legal expert. I have really have no, uh, I don't know uh, enough to, to say uh, something substantive. But my last question, when my last comments to end my talk actually was, what I'm, I've been thinking, that is the Chinese way of doing business 
or informal way of getting things done has been practiced for so many years, have been well understood, well practiced in the Chinese context. And so within people, people have expectations. People know how to respond strategically to these issues. But once you put it in an in international regime of different re rule regimes, like the contractual laws, I think you legal uh, scholars know much better than I do, these suddenly becomes an issue. So one of the complaints I read a lot is that rules, they, they do not expect China would abide by the rules, by the expectations, because you know, in the past, people have you know, rules, but not enforced rules, not being uh, uh, followed uh, to the expectations. So I think that could be a major issue. That is, in the past, we think about China entering the uh, global stage, and you know, gradually there will be uh, consistencies and, and in practice in the rules. Maybe the rules will be changed because of the you know the, the power China brings into the world stage. But integration into the international regime of rules and whatever other uh, uh, regulations is an important part of you know uh, I think what what is going to happen uh, if uh, for China's future. So in that sense, I also think the way we discuss informal social relations in China today will have some implications about the global uh, behaviors or standings of China in the future. Right. I mean, I, I really want to ask this one last question uh, from a colleague uh, from business school, uh, Professor Gao Pingyang. Okay, sorry, it's very late. I understand, it's very late. Sorry, just one last question from Professor Gao. I am more optimistic. I don't know what he referred to. I appreciate the comparative perspective you have adopted in relating it to the state building in Europe. There, the change was driven by the industrialization and the rise of commercial interest. I think the same change has been taking place in China. One example is that I think the rule of law is more prominent in areas with higher level of marketization. What do you think is the role of the expansion of arms land interaction among social members play in shaping the state building? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, I think if I understand uh, the question correctly, is most recent internet interactions or interactions over internet that might you know, uh, create new platform, new dynamics that will induce rule abiding or formal rules or formal regulations that everybody can abide by and can create, you know, at least a new path, uh, you know, that lead to cumulative change over time. Let's wait and see. I'm not, uh, at least in the short run, I'm not that uh, um, optimistic. In the long run, you, you know, maybe the, the, whatever the third wave of industrialization or post-industrialization would lead to a different path for China. But the presently, at least the way I see it, I think we probably is more uh, changing in the long cycles uh, from one stage to another and back rather than making substantial progress, at least within current framework. And that's my, uh, how I feel about in the short run. Thank you very much, Professor Joe. I know it's very, very late um, in California, so I wouldn't keep you here further. Um, we are over time already. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I very much, uh, I learned a great deal from you and Professor Lee, and um, I really appreciate that you come. And I want to thank the audience for staying uh, so long. And thanks, i see you next time. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Li Jin. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jokan, so Bye -bye. much.